Excuse me. Well, I'd like to welcome everybody. Uh, I realize, uh, thank you for coming out to Saturday during finals. It's a challenging time, I understand. Um, but it's a very important topic. We had a great program yesterday kicking off the ECE 125, and we're going to continue that today. We're going to talk about women in engineering this morning, and that's a very important topic. And then we're going to follow that up, welcome everyone afterwards to our barbecue outside and our drone competition, and then we're going to continue this afternoon with some future technologies and the future of education. Um, so I welcome you all, uh, and I'll leave it to our esteemed panelists here. Hi, I'm Nancy Karabjanian. I am a journalist, but as of August, I have become the director of the Center for Political Communication here on the campus. So I'm privileged to be here for a part of this, this event today. You know, the real question is, is whether it's lean in or man up or navigate the labyrinth instead of a ladder. For women in this field, it is a, a challenge, and that's what we're going to talk about as we mark this anniversary or a milestone. Take your pick of which word. So the topic is women in engineering, and I am joined by some wonderful people. Karen Block, her resume includes 30 years with the DuPont Company, and three degrees, all from the University of Delaware. Welcome. Janine Barbicane is a member of the class of 01. You chair the UDECE Advisory Council, and you're a federal account executive with Oracle. Welcome. We also have Nicole Wells, who after earning, earning her degree in 2013, became a West Coaster. <laughs> she now works for Apple. And walking in commencement exercises next week to earn her bachelor's in electrical engineering is Sarah Jensen, who, by the way, is celebrating her birthday. And last night was the recipient of the Senior Design Poster Competition Award. So congratulations to you. It's a lot ahead of you. <laughs> And I think you'll have some good information to take you forward from these peers now, soon to be peers as of next weekend. Scary thought. So the reality check. <laughs> they say as many women as enter the field, leave the field. Karen, is that what you have seen? I have seen that um, trend continue. Um, you, know, you always look at, well, what is it? Um, I, as you've mentioned, have three technical degrees. Um, However, I went, was working in research for a long time, but then I took a slightly different path and went into people leadership, strategic planning. So I, too, veered off of that somewhat, but still in a highly technical field, still engaged with very, very technical uh, organizations within our company. The reasons for me, I think, were um, opportunity for me. I actually saw greater opportunity by my taking a slightly different path. So um, I'm not sure if that's true for everyone, uh, but that was my reason. Well, let's see if what Janine's experience has been. Yeah, so I would agree that um, I, I do see the trend where as many uh, women leave the field as enter, but I think that um, you could really say that across um, any industry. The challenge with technology is just not as many women are entering the field. And I think so that- So the base is smaller. Right, and so um, I think it's critical when women um, get into the technology industry and start working, that they find mentors and executive sponsors to help them continue in their career. And I do think it's really critical for women to start reducing this, or to keep um, on this momentum of reducing the gender gap in management and leadership roles. If you think about it today, in the technology industry, 2% um, of, the, of the CEOs in Fortune 500 companies are women and only 9% hold management positions. There's that saying, 2% is good for milk. Right. <laughs> but not for America. <laughs> exactly. Well, let, let's get to building the base. What, what was your spark of interest, which made you say, this is a place where I can find myself in my future? Yeah, so what initially drew me to engineering was generally that I enjoyed math a lot when I was young in high school. Um, that was always my favorite subject. And then I actually was drawn somewhat by the fact that there was a lot of scholarship available for women in engineering. So um, when I was choosing my major in college, I was very indecisive and didn't want to make a decision. But then I thought, like, if you like math this much, you're probably going to be an engineer. And you might as well choose it now and go for the scholarship money. <laughs> so that's what initially drew me. And then I went for electrical because of the types of engineering. I was drawn to things like um, robotics and machine learning and um, computer science and all that area. And so that 
took me towards EC. I wish you could have seen Sarah going, mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> As you were speaking. So really, is that similar to your experience that got you to this pre-week before graduation? Yeah, so um, I, I think what drew me to it, though, is my parents both work for the Army. And just seeing my parents go through it, it's, it that's, I wanted to follow in their path. But then I also liked math a lot. Yeah. So <laughs> this is a good place for it. Mm -hmm. And then I got to ECE because I found a really good professor that offered me a, a job back when I was still uh, pre-college. Uh, pre and he got me in the lab and actually got me to play with stuff. And I was like, this is really fun. I just want to stay here. <laughs> and I think that's what's critical so, is exposure. Sorry, mm. Karen. Oh, no, please go you ahead. You know, at an early age, it mm. really is to the field because I think a lot of times in you know getting women into the field, it's getting exposure in those younger years. I, mm. I, um, I had the opportunity to go to, I don't advertise this, but I went to engineering camp at Penn <laughs> State University. And um, they, and this was between my junior and senior year in high school, and I got exposure to all the different disciplines within engineering. We went into the labs. We got to. Um, so you were 16, 17 years old age. having this experience. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. I would trace my interests much earlier and not through such a formal setup, but through my father. My father was a carpenter, and I would hang out with him, and it became an, an interest in solving problems. How do things work? And. Those early, I mean, probably six, seven years old, you know, I was starting to build things. I was starting to figure out how things worked. Mm -hmm. And that really, I think, evolved into the interest. And then later, mm -hmm. you know, had some exposure. But it was really very informal. Nicole, when you think about um, what is ahead for you, especially mm -hmm. the fact that this industry is changing by the speed of light, mm -hmm mostly because of the company you work for, yep. things change very <laughs> rapidly. Do, do you, can you foresee the challenges ahead of you and plan to deal with them? Yeah, I think I can. I think I have trouble foreseeing what is ahead for me. Like, like I think there's a very traditional sense of rising in the company and like becoming a VP, that should be the goal, but I don't really see myself doing that for some reason, and so I think at this early stage of my career, I'm still trying to define what it is that I want out of my career. And so I'm thinking about, you know, do I want to do different roles or prototyping or go back to school and study again? Or I'm still in a very unsure what the future holds phase. Um, but I do, I think that whichever of those paths I choose, that I do see a way for me to move forward. I don't feel like I'm inhibited. I feel like, like there's a lot of possibilities and I can go in a lot of directions. Well, knowing someone who's a, you know, at your point, you probably don't think about those things yet, right? This is not on your list of things to do, overcome obstacles. <laughs> and, uh, well, I guess I'm thinking about just the future in general, though, because I know I want to get my PhD, but then I'm trying to figure out what to do after that. <laughs> I don't know. How are the, what are the challenges for being a woman at the table? Uh, lack of mentors, certainly. Um, that is critical at any stage of your career. And Janine, to your point, there are so few women, mm -hmm. particularly as we look up, mm -hmm. that you know, I think that's a, that's a big challenge. And I'm still used to being the only woman in the room. Are you usually the only woman in the room? Usually, yes. <laughs> Sometimes, <laughs> although our VP is actually a woman, so um, I can look up to her. <laughs> That's good. How about for you in the classroom? Uh, in the classroom, there's usually like a couple other women, but usually in my group projects, I'm the only female. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did that ever be a, become a concern for you? Uh, not really. It's, it's most of the guys just, we have this thing to get done. We work on it together and we get it done. Mm -hmm. It's I think, really nice. So I wonder, is that an advantage? Because in my early career, mm -hmm. Before they had a word for it, I had mm -hmm. to deal with mansplaining all the time. <laughs> <laughs> but that would be because mine was a verbal field. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it was easy to just yeah. roll with it. <laughs> but because this is technical, mm -hmm. it, the proof is in the knowledge. We have a common language that we're starting from, absolutely. Yeah. And how has that um, been the advantage? I think I've been fortunate throughout most of my career that I have not looked at at gender as an issue because I really didn't see large obstacles. There were always a few individuals along the way that 
uh, not a fan of. Um, but in general, it was you're there to do something, to do a job, to do a role, and you're part of a team that has a purpose, and that's really where the focus was. You two must find that very encouraging. <laughs> <laughs> I do. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and along that point, I mean, I would agree. I, early on in my career, I never thought about, um, you know, um, male versus female or, you know, differences in, in the gender gap. I really just thought about um, what I wanted to do, you know, thinking about the future and really about, you know, getting into the roles um, and the opportunities that were provided to me and just doing the best job I could, you know, and it was all about performance to me. Um, and then it wasn't until really in recent years, again, when I started to really aspire into management and leadership positions that you realize that there aren't a lot of women, right, in the, in the leadership or in the management and leadership roles. So um, that's actually become a goal of mine to help to kind of reduce that, that gap. But I think that also, um, you know, there are the women that are in the field and that are continuing to work. and. Um, my experience has been, especially ones that are in, you know, senior management and leadership positions, um, that they have, you know, at times when it has been challenging, right, they haven't maybe had a mentor or they had, you know, responsibilities with their family. You know, they've had, um, fortunately, supportive um, companies and management teams that have allowed them to either take a step back or to, um, do, you know, just to, to do what they needed to do to make it work, mm -hmm. but they continued to work, which was the critical point, and now they're in, in senior leadership positions. Mm -hmm. So conversely then, if they were not in a supportive environment, mm -hmm. the result probably would have been they left the field. Correct, yes. Mm -hmm. So it's time and place mm -hmm. is part of the essential ingredient. Mm -hmm. hmm. Did you ever feel you had to hide your femininity? Uh, no. Not, I mean, I will say, um, especially because I also work with the government, <laughs> so there's a whole, um, uh, you know, a culture that goes along with working, especially with the federal government. But um, no, I think, you know, again, it just goes back to, uh, you know, being a professional and, you know, focusing on your work and, and doing the best job that you can do. How have women changed the field? <sighs> Well, wow. I'm trying to think about that. I mean, it's, you know, as with any diverse team, I, I think I'm gonna put this back to diversity, mm -hmm. diversity of thought, uh, not necessarily gender, but having diverse teams, diverse um, population of people in a field that's how you get new ideas. That's how you move things and leap ideas forward. So I would put it to a diverse mindset. What about the feminine leadership model, though? Does that change anything? I know women lead differently than men. It definitely do. And I think, I think, um, I think women bring a, a different aspect, for sure, to um, leadership. Um, compared to men. It's just a different leadership styles, different leadership approaches. And I can tell you in a lot of the companies that um, I've worked for, um, other companies that I interact with, they're looking for more and more women um, because they want to promote diversity and they want to have more and more women in management and leadership roles because of that element of what women bring to the table versus men. It's just, it could be a different, a different approach. Um, uh, specific examples are, um, you know, just creativity, um, you know, just coming from a different angle. Also, um, women traditionally, I think, really focus on team, um, learning, you know, collaboration, um, working together. <laughs> and, um, and that's, you know, and that's not to say that men do not, but I would say that, um, you know, women do have that, do um, promote collaboration and, and team learning. So I think that companies welcome that in management and leadership. Well, that's the Silicon Valley model, right? Yeah, that is. Um, I was thinking about so I um, am actually became a manager about a year ago, um, so I'm like a pretty new manager. And there's another girl on our team who also became a manager pretty early in her career, because both of us have been there less than four years. Um, and in our team, 
Our team's kind of a very stereotypically nerdy, like heavy science team. Um, you wear that proudly though, <laughs> I like that. Um, but so there's, I guess there's a stereotype that people on our team are not the most socially skilled. And I wonder if the reason that she and I like became managers so quickly is because we're stronger communicators, or you know, <laughs> how shall we politely say? It's okay say? to say the topic is women in engineering, <laughs> but also the insight that a woman has, correct? Yeah. I mean, women are more empathetic mm -hmm. as just a general rule um, because we aren't always in shark mode. Mm -hmm. we, uh, I tend to be more of a shark than an empathetic person, yeah. though I do admit. But <laughs> I, I get that impression from mm -hmm. reading much about, especially women in engineering, mm -hmm. that there is that moment where you're looking around the team to see who has what to bring instead of just trying to move the force forward. Mm -hmm. And has that been your experience? Yeah, I think it's definitely based on individuals, but as a general trend, I think the women on my team tend to be less aggressive personalities in meetings, you know, more like, more willing to listen to different viewpoints and less, less aggressive in, in pushing their idea forward. But. So of all of what we're hearing to this point, what do you think is uh, the biggest message to you and to women at your point in your career about to enter in to the world of working? Um. Just listen to everyone's experience and try to learn as much as you can about it. Everyone has really good things to tell you, I guess. Yeah. And also, it's okay to be aggressive because I know, at least in my senior design group, we we liked pushing each other, and that really pushed us, pushed us farther. And that's just how we talk to each other. What would you do differently? What would I do differently? Um, well, this this is very specific to me and my sort of path, not particularly because I'm a woman, but um, I went to work right out of undergrad and didn't go to grad school till I, after I'd been working quite some time. You went to work for the company. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. So I started with DuPont and I'd been there some years and it was there that I had uh, the exposure to research, applied research, and decided I really wanted to go back to grad school. I was fortunate in that my company was supportive of me doing that part time, but I felt like because I was working um, full time, school part time, I missed out on some of the the camaraderie that you develop in grad school. You know, there's there's a bond that forms with grad students, the intensity. And because I was always leaving campus to go back to work, I, I missed that. So I, I regret not doing that straight away. Is there something you'd do differently? Um, well, I think I, I guess I would. I might. What I would do differently is probably along the lines of with, with Karen as well. I think it's critical after um, undergraduate, you know, the timing of when you go back to graduate school. Um, because you, um, especially if you want to maybe stay in the technical field but also um, excel in business, you know, there's a certain time period where it helps to get some exposure in industry, but then to go back to school at a critical, at, early enough in your career that you're able to really form some of those mm -hmm. bonds and networking early on. And again, this is very, you know, specific to, um, to, to you know, technology and business, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I think that's critical is kind of the timing of when you pursue um, that second degree. And then the other thing I would just mention is that um, I was fortunate early on to have some great mentors, um, but I noticed in my career that when, you know, for different reasons, the mentors took different jobs or I was, you know, or, or they were promoted and I had taken different positions with different companies. Um, you know, when I didn't have a mentor is when, you know, you kind of can easily lose your way. So I think it's always critical if the mentors just are not avail made available to you, either because they seek you out or a company requires that. Um, there, or I shouldn't say requires, but offers a mentorship program, then ultimately seek out mentors yourself. Mm -hmm. It's critical, I think, in any position, um, whether you're in technical or you know, focused in management or in business, to have mentors and then ultimately, as you, you know, evolve in your career, have executive sponsors who are gonna help to open more doors for you yeah. later on. And the flip, um, excuse me, the, the flip side, the importance of being a, me yes. a mentor as a, ment a mentor. Yes, yeah. a mentor and having mentees. Because yeah. mm -hmm. actually, and I've learned in my experience, you get just as much out of that experience Absolutely. in mentoring somebody as you do mm -hmm. being mentored yourself. So do you look at freshmen and think, I can help? 
I try to. <laughs> I don't. I, some, sometimes people come up to me for advice because I'm I'm part of Scottish Country Dancing Club, and so we get a lot of younger students, and they see me going off and doing things. I said, "Well, this is what I've done. You can come do it too." Mm -hmm. yeah. How were your mentors a factor for you, especially while you were here on campus and as you were making that that push out west? Yeah. yeah. Um, so when I was on campus, I'd say the mentorship I got was mostly in the form of my lab group, which was Seaborg. That's um, a group in the EC department that does a bunch of different research, but I did electrical car research with them. Um, and I found that the professor, Dr. Kiamlov, who had led that group, um, he had a very mentoring role and that when I was trying to decide whether I should go to Apple or whether I should go to grad school or what I should do, I remember feeling kind of guilty that I wasn't going to stay and go to grad school and like telling him like, I'm sorry, you invested all this like time in me and I'm just like abandoning you. And I remember him saying something along the lines of, um, well, it, it wasn't about like keeping you here forever. It was about like helping you find a path that's right for you. So <laughs> go be free. And so, <laughs> that is so dark. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> So I thought that was very nice. And so. That seems to be an essential mm -hmm. part of it to be a success for you. Mm -hmm. So when you think about where you've been over the past, of the past four years, mm -hmm. do you see how each little tiny plus and minus success or failure helped you to be an award winner last night, somebody on the, yeah. the verge of graduating? Yeah, no, it, it's... I can remember most of the pluses, but the minuses kind of just fade from your mind after a while. Yeah, it's, just, yeah. it's, it's having just people right in there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're still right there. Right there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I've been blessed to have a lot of people that, that that really emphasize the plus, and if it's there's a minus, it's it's okay. You can get over it. Just mm -hmm. keep focusing on the pluses mm -hmm. and just keep going. Mm -hmm. Would you two recommend to them, as we talked about a, a moment earlier, that it says as important to have a plan for the future, but to understand when you may want to step back in order to be able to take that next step. Mm -hmm. That's got to be difficult to accept at a younger part of your career. And you're, you're really still at the younger part of your <laughs> career, but it seems that that has to be something that you have to be prepared and courageous enough to do. Yeah, I, I think it's not just step back necessarily, but it's being open to a different path you know we all have plans and we think we have our five-year plans you know, I think most of us as you know engineers we're organized we tend to be very focused and and driven but life comes up um, changes in your business come up that you could wind up doing something completely different and being open to that that moment of change is really, really important. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as I said, whether it's deciding family or not, whether it's your company is bought or sold, or you know, just changes in workforce, whatever the case may be, you've gotta be open to hopping on a different path and mm -hmm. moving forward. Yeah, I would agree with that, is you know, being open to change um, and, and really open to opportunities as they're afforded to you. Um, but also, uh, a, great, a great point about having a plan. So one of my, probably my first, um, my first manager, uh, or my first boss out of college, um, he was a great, you know, became a great mentor and friend uh, to this day. And he always, um, he had me map out, you know, my my short-term and long-term plan, right? My three-year, my five-year, my ten-year. So he said, you always have to have a three-year, a five-year, and ten-year. And then he also um, gave great guidance in the fact that he said, you know, you want to, especially early in your career, always be, you know, um, changing positions every three to five years, you know, because he feels the first year you really get into a role, get your, you know, you're, you're kind of drinking from the fire hose, right? And then. The second year, you sort of have an understanding of what you're doing, but then you have to, um, you know, you, you're still not, you, you have an understanding, but you know, you might not be at that point where you're making a critical impact, and then the third year and forward, you are making a critical impact, and then you get comfortable. <laughs> and he said, as soon as you get comfortable, then it's, then it's time to make a change. But, um, <laughs> yeah, you know, so I always had that plan, um, and the other, the, the third critical thing that he taught me was that your life goals are just as important as your professional goals, and that you need to constantly be balancing both. And um, so, you know, in mapping out that plan to be mapping out what your professional goals in addition to your life, you know, life goals. And I can't speak from experience, but I, um, I, there's a, 
um, senior vice president at the company that I work for. And, um, you know, her and I have had a lot of conversations about how she managed her professional goals with her life goal and her life goals because she wanted to have children. And um, she ended up having twins, <laughs> which made it even more. Um, so she was actually in a very you know, demanding position in management at the time, uh, working for Oracle Corporation, and she had twins. And um, you know, she was really um, faced with the decision, do I leave you know, the workforce and raise my family, or do I stay in and just try to stick it out? How can I do this? Because obviously managing twins at a young age is a lot of work. And um, fortunately, the company culture um, was supportive. Um, and I think the organization within which she worked was supportive. Most importantly, her management was supportive. And they actually worked with her to allow her to take a step back from that management role and to get into more of an individual contributor role where she didn't have as much responsibility while her her children were young mm -hmm. and then but she was still working and she was still able to keep up with what was going on and then later when her children were older and didn't depend on her as much she was able to continue in her career and now she's on her way to be an executive vice president for the company well wow. uh, actually if I can just build on I've got a kind of a, an opposite I had a, a gentleman who worked for me um, and he and his uh, wife were starting their family she was in the the management position where there was um, more direct day-to-day -day responsibility and he was in an individual contributor role um, and he's the one who stepped back Mm -hmm. He's, he took um, a part-time status to enable more time with the children, which enabled her to stay in, into the more intense role. And that worked for them for several years until their children were a little bit older. Right. So a great be point. open to alternative ways of approaching it. Right. And it's all about how you can make it work. Yeah. With your... You to get. quote Tim Gunn, make it work. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to go to questions in just a moment. We have... Uh, a microphone that we're going to be tossing out into the audience. Trust me, if you were here yesterday, you know it works. It's pretty cool. It's like just throwing the the ball at the concert, I guess. And it's actually so. While you think of your questions, and we get ready to toss the microphone around, I do want to know if at this point of when you walked into the University of Delaware, did people say you're going to major in what? <laughs> did people so, find it shocking? So most people didn't find it shocking because they knew who my parents were. And they knew that's just where I was going. But there was one time where I was talking to a student and they asked, well, you're an electrical engineer. That's a weird major for a girl. And that just always stuck with me as like, OK, I don't know what to do with this. Did you ever find people go, you know, why are, why are you in this male dominated universe? I think not people who knew me personally. I think anyone who knew me before school was like, oh, that makes sense. Um, <laughs> I think it's only, you know, strangers or someone who doesn't know me at all and is just like chatting you up and then they're like, oh, engineer, huh, <laughs> you know? But, it still happens. I yeah. have a daughter in medical school and she's yeah. endlessly, people assume she's going for nursing. Yeah, yeah. And she's going for her surgery. Yeah. She's going for surgery, <laughs> right. like, you know. And, you know, this is 2017. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you both probably, still, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Well, who has a question? We're going to, if Steve could throw the ball out there to anyone who has a question, we can get started. Oh, get ready. Here it comes. <laughs> and that is your mic. Okay. Hi, Karen. This is a question for you. Okay. Um, so you mentioned the, the, your executive have found an alternative solution. Um, have you seen that improving through your career? And do you think that that alternative will actually become standard at some point and not thought of as alternative? I certainly hope it becomes you know, the norm as opposed to in an, an unusual situation, but I would still say it's still unusual at this stage. But has it improved over your career? Um, I still see it not very often. So I would say I'm not seeing a lot of, a lot of shift right now, unfortunately. Is that, um, just to get to what we know is from the headlines, is that also though the nature of attrition? within your company mm. that um, you, know, you have to hold on rather than look for alternative solutions? Um, I think it, it, is, it is certainly very individualistic and it is, to, to Janine's point, very um, company culture. I will say our, our corporation is, is very supportive to trying to find alternative paths for people um, or option, optionality. But I think people still aren't 
in themselves necessarily thinking about what are the alternative options. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you've got to you've got to ask for it to make it happen, and I think people aren't asking for it enough. Too mm -hmm. that that's a factor I think. Note that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh <there. laughs> nice. <laughs> Out of the top. Um, Nicole and Sarah, um, mm -hmm. if you had a magic wand, what would you have us do in the department that might make it uh, better for women coming through <coughs> electrical and computer engineering? Um, so once you get into the department, I absolutely adore our department. I don't right. think I would change that much. I know it's hard getting people in the door, though. And I'm not trying to fix that. Similarly, I, I don't feel like I had any problems once I got to college. I think that there's just um, less women coming in and that it's at some point younger in their career when they get kind of turned off of math or turned off of science when they're in elementary or middle school or sometime around then when they think it's like not cool. But I think by the time we get here, it's a very supportive environment. So we, do we need to do some kind of more aggressive high school yeah. maybe, outreach, maybe. recruiting, go drag them, drag them in and throw them in the <laughs> I can do that. Yeah. For some, like, 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 like uh, you had, you mentioned the summer engineering. We, mm -hmm. we have a governor school here, and we have mm -hmm. a summer uh, college program for kids. I know my daughter liked the summer college. Mm -hmm. We need to drag them in and throw them in the lab. Yeah, yeah. Well, because that's how Marosnik okay. got me. <laughs> yeah. But okay. there is one thing that I, at least it got brought to my attention by some of the other student RSOs. As of right now, we got told don't go talk to younger kids because we're not insured for it. If we could have some way that we can get stu let students, college students, actually be able to go out into the community and talk to people. That'd okay. be great. I, I don't know what's going on with that. Just a, a bunch of RSOs got hauled in and said, don't do that. We're, you're not really an RSO. You're with the ECE department, mm -hmm. and we can't mm -hmm. do that. You understand that? Yeah, kind of. Oh. <laughs> but there is also the K-12 engineering program, and, and we right? we have those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. um, but I think... Um, Dr. K, who mm -hmm. you guys mentioned, um, we have a, a unique program where we recruit students as sophomores and they, they basically work as engineers until they're seniors and they are real engineers when they graduate. Mm -hmm. And we have a new faculty member that's doing a similar program. Um, it's not like who comes to the K-12. It's like we need to go out and snag a few at mm -hmm. each mm -hmm. high school, yeah. mm -hmm. make them come, send the word back. <laughs> right. Oh, you like this? Go do this. Thing. Uh, yeah. Because I, I, okay. I, sorry, Kate, I can tell you. I, I mean, I didn't. I wasn't asking to go to engineering camp. <laughs> that was something my parents really encouraged me to do, um, and I think they may have just dropped me off. Um, <laughs> and then they went luck. on vacation. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, but um, I. I would say um, that I think also too maybe it's an education at, for the parents, you know, at, at within um, you know at the grade school and high school. Because even if the parents aren't necessarily in technical fields themselves, it's just understanding what a technical con degree and a, a degree in you know electrical and computer engineering can provide for their children. And I think it's understanding all of the different um, opportunities out of school, whether it's in academia or industry. Because I. Going into school, although I was very excited once I got to UD, um, you know, to uh, move forward with this degree, I was not aware of all of the different opportunities that would be made available to me after, you know, post graduation. Mm -hmm. And just quickly, one one word of caution. I'll put it that way. Um, you know, there are camps available. There are programs available at different age levels, but we need to be careful of. Uh, the, the socioeconomic divide. There are individuals who can't afford an N-week summer camp at a university. So we find, need to find ways to reach into different populations. I wasn't thinking about that. I was mm. thinking about. Yeah. Uh, we have like something called summer scholars. Or you just go mm. and find find a, a good uh, technical leader at a high school who's mm -hmm. doing the IT program or whatever, and say. Give me your best two students. I'll reach out to them. They yeah. can come work. We'll, we'll pay them this summer. They can yeah. come sit in the lab and do yeah. some fun stuff. And then we 
It's like an internship at a company. Yeah, yeah but, and that, that's great. That's great. I think we have time for another question. Does anybody else want to get the bouncing ball? It's over here to this side. Get ready. And <laughs> nice. Get a touchdown for that one? <laughs> no, I was just going to revisit Nancy's question. I think it actually was sort of a, to me personally, I think it was a really critical one maybe for advocacy for, you know, certainly females in the workplace, which was going back to the question of, is there any time where uh, you know women have impacted work as opposed to re you know reacted to work? I just think my own case. Um, I had a team of uh, about eight guys, and I don't know. There seemed to be something missing there in the chemistry department. So I went to Cal Poly. I'm an engineer advisor. I got this wonderful woman, uh, Bridget. So she had computer science and as engineering background. Anyway, uh, the impact was almost instantaneous. Not only did they seem to dress better, smell better, <laughs> <laughs> they got to work earlier. But no, but what, for me to advocate, I, I work for the CEO, so I, for me to make impact and, and basically enhance that, then magnify that, I had to go to the bottom line. So I could actually show that before she was there, how many releases of software he had and how long it took per release, after I had very quantitative information that there was a real tangible impact and she had changed the workplace. As a result of that, I was able to hire a few more people. So I was just wondering, do you have any other sort of along that line of sort of the, on the data side or maybe even, you know, getting more data on how the, it's had tangible impact? There are numerous studies about diversity in general and those companies that have a diverse workforce have more successful bottom lines. Mm -hmm. The numerous studies that support that approach. And I don't have a data specific example I mean you you know there's a lot of women I mean today you know who have made an impact in the tech industry right I mean you're just Cheryl Sandberg right Marissa Meyer um, Safra Katz in my organization so you st there are women who have made an impact on technology and um, I think it's it's you know and, and across the board I see um, you know um, women who are in leadership and, and management positions, you know, making an impact because they are more empathetic, they're more willing to listen. <laughs> At times, they may dress better. <laughs> but also, I mean, they, they're focused on collaboration, they're focused, you know, on developing their people and the skill sets of their people, um, whether they're women or men. Uh, but I think ultimately, as well, um, women, um, where, you know, where they Tend to, I should say, where they um, tend to make an impact is, I mean, within their teams, in management and leadership roles, but um, really it's, it's a cultural thing, and I see more and more companies now wanting to have women in their company and also on their teams, whether it be management or leadership or even an individual contributor, so that they can make an impact, right? Because it does bring a different element to the team environment and to, you know, the just the learning environment and the overall culture of the company. Thank you. Is that what you're finding as well, Nicole? Yeah, um, I think so. I think it's hard for us to see as dramatic of a quantitative impact as he did because we aren't starting from zero. You know, mm -hmm. like when we come in, there are some women already. Um, but I do think, yeah, the more that we have, then the more the more balanced the conversation is. The interesting shift to me is as someone who's just an observer, which is what I did for a living for most of my career as a journalist, is that those very same qualities that are now considered attractive were the qualities that held women back. That empathetic, that listening, that collaborative nature is what kept them out of the boys club. <laughs> and now it, it, it seemed, it, it's, it's very comforting to yeah. know that that is beginning to change. Any one more question from someone? to take the bouncing ball? Oh, this is going to be a challenge. He wants to throw it. <laughs> Somebody has to have a question. Let's see. All right, here we go. All right, we'll do a 20. Awesome. Very nice. Very good. Good arm. Good arm. Hi. Uh, I'm wondering um, about the dynamics within a meeting. Um, there's a story that came out of the Obama administration where some of the women uh, would sit around and make suggestions about certain things and they noticed that their suggestions weren't being picked up. And so in the meetings what they began to do was amplify one another. So if, you know, Valerie made a comment, um, someone else would pick that up and say, well, as Valerie said, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to make sure because what typically was happening was a woman would make the comment, the meeting would go on, and then sometime later, 
John would make the comment and suddenly it would be brilliant and it would be <laughs> John's idea. So I'm wondering if, you know, during your time you've, you know, seen similar dynamics and whether or not you make a conscious effort to amplify other women's ideas mm -hmm. in your teams. So for me, at least, um, I'd say I noticed some dynamics in meetings, like not quite the amplification thing, but y you know the Sheryl Sandberg like sit at the table thing where mm -hmm. there's usually like a table and there's a couple chairs around it and then there's like benches along the walls. And so um, she says she noticed that a lot of women tend to go in and then like file out to the, the benches on the side and then like not come sit at the main table and it's like a I guess a confidence thing, or you think that like someone more important has to sit at the table, you know, like someone above me will sit at the table. And so um, I have noticed in our meetings that that does tend to be a trend. And so like mm. I'll have to make a conscious effort to be like, I'm going to sit at the table today. <laughs> like I'm important <laughs> to this meeting. Yeah. And so I'll go do it. Um, and then in terms of like amplification, I have, I think in general, sometimes people talk over each other. I haven't noticed people do it more to me because I'm a woman, but I have noticed um, men in our group say, like, that's what she just said, or, you know, like, mm -hmm. like that's Nicole's point, or, you know, so I, I don't think that, I think maybe amplification needs to happen, but I think that the men in our company are doing a pretty good job of, of helping. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ladies, think, oh, go ahead. One well, last just, point. We'll no, just from Karen. Uh, to emphasize that men are an important role in advancing women, mm -hmm. whether it's amplification, whether it's recognizing the importance of a balanced team. Mm -hmm. To each of you, thank you. Thank, thank you so thank very you. much. And before we wrap up, I think we should all offer our congratulations to our soon to be graduate. <laughs> That's quite an accomplishment, and we're very proud of you. And Nicole, thank you for taking the red eye. <laughs> now there is more to come, so do know that there, your, your brains will continue to be stimulated today, but first we're going to feed your soul as well and your stomach. So lunch is being offered on the green, so meet us back here, go, come back around 1.15, and that's when we'll be talking about a little bit of history and a little bit of the future of technology and education. So thank you all so much for your time and attention this morning, and thanks to each of you as well. Thank you. Thank Thank you.